This talk follows on from my first talk on Egyptian art, where I covered the um, the Old and the Middle Kingdom and ended with the Second Intermediate Period. I introduced the culture or geography of Egypt, so if you're unfamiliar with that, it's probably best to start with the the first talk. So this talk, I'm starting with the New Kingdom, which was the golden age of ancient Egypt when it was at its most prosperous and its mightiest. It lasted about 500 years from the 18th to the 20th dynasty. That's from about 1500 BCE to 1000 BCE. And Egypt expanded during this period to include the Levant and Nubia to the south. Some of the most um, famous and powerful pharaohs include Amosis I. He was the one who defeated the Hykos, which um, I mentioned at the end of my previous talk, and reunited the country. So he was the founder of the New Kingdom. Now, Hatshepsut was the wife of of Thutmosis II, who was the great-grandson of Armosis I, and she ruled as king for over a decade after her husband Thutmosis died. Excuse me. <coughs> and she's been described as the first well-recorded great woman in history. Amenhotep III, he reigned during a period of unprecedented prosperity and splendour. Egypt reached its peak of artistic and international power, and he's considered one of the, um, the great pharaohs. He was succeeded by his son, Amenhotep IV, who changed his name to Akhenaten, and um, I'll tell you a bit more about that later, but he moved the capital to Amarna, a new city he created in the desert. Perhaps one of the most famous of the New Kingdom pharaohs was Tutankhamun. He was a boy king. He died when he was only 18 or 19, ruled for only nine years. But the reason he's um, so famous today was because of the discovery of his tomb by Howard Carter in 1922. And then finally, of the the sort of short list of great pharaohs that I'm covering today is Ramesses II, who brought Egypt to new heights of power and prosperity, often regarded as the greatest, most celebrated, most powerful pharaoh, and so is often called Ramesses the Great. One of the most successful warrior pharaohs conducted some 15 military campaigns, all resulting in vic victories. Well, perhaps with the exception of the Battle of Kadesh, which is um, maybe considered a stalemate. He, he's the one who the Greeks called Ozymandias. So, Armosis I, as I said, best known for defeating the Hykos and reuniting Egypt. He also invaded the area which is modern-day Palestine, and to the south, northern Nubia. He re-established Thebes, which is modern-day Luxor, as the capital, with Memphis as a sort of secondary capital in the north. Now, Memphis was the largest city in the world at the time, but was um, overtaken by Thebes in the New Kingdom after it was made the capital and continued to grow for the next 900 years. Amosis is also known for his monumental constructions, including this pyramid uh, built as a mortuary temple. And um, the it, it has collapsed. It was originally some 40 metres high, but it was built of sand and rub rubble clad in limestone blocks. So it looked um, spectacular when it was built, but because of the um, 
way that it was constructed, it's collapsed and all that remains today is this 10 metre high pile of rubble. Hatshepsut was the um, wife of Thutmosis II, as I said. He died and she ruled as a king for a decade. That might surprise you, but they didn't have a word for a female ruler, what we call a queen. And this was the first time that the word pharaoh was used. I've been using the word pharaoh, although I've, I've tried to use the word king more often. The word pharaoh actually means temple, which might seem odd calling the, the, the monarch temple, but it's similar in a way to what the British call, or when the British call the monarchy, the crown. So it's a term that can mean a physical object. It can refer to the monarch or even the state as a whole. And that's the way the word pharaoh uh, became used and its meaning expanded from referring to a temple to referring to the monarch and even the state. Now, in Egyptian art, as I said, women are shown with pale or white skin and men with a browny red skin. She was um, represented as um, a man with dark masculine skin and with a beard, as you see here. And she was a powerful ruler. She transformed Thebes into a glorious capital city. Her obelisk at Karnak, which is called Hatshepsut's obelisk, is a monolithic 300 ton, ton obelisk, the highest in Egypt. It was covered in gold leaf at the top and so would have shone in the sun. And the inscription at the base talks about the people of the future who will talk about and honour what she had done. So it's a sort of a, a signpost for posterity. Her crowning glory, I think, is the temple, Hatshepsut's temple on the superhighway north of Karnak. It looks modern, clean. In fact, it looks like a 1930s fascist architecture. And every aspect of it boasts of her brilliance and her exploits. Inside, for example, there's um, an intimate chapel dedicated to Hathor, the mother goddess, the cow goddess Hathor, which she suckles from. And then there's a small figure, this is inside, of Senemut, her right-hand man, who was responsible for the construction of the temple. Now, I apologise in advance, but I felt I had to show you this um, well-known graffiti. It was in a cave near her temple, where there's a number of graffiti on the wall, but um, they include this one here, which represents a man, well, as you can see, a man and a woman engaged in sexual activity, and some scholars claim it represents a relationship between her um, right-hand man, Senemut, and Hatshepsut. And although it's not labelled as such, the woman does appear to be wearing a royal headdress. Who knows? It. Um, I think it tells us something about what at least one of the workers thought about um, their relationship, but it doesn't actually tell us much about their actual relationship, which isn't um, recorded. The next great pharaoh was Amenhotep III, and these are two massive statues of him. They were built about 1350 BCE, and they stand in front of his mortuary temple. Now, Amenhotep was a superb diplomat, and the way he operated 
was he would give lavish gifts to the surround the leaders of the surrounding nations and as a result he received even more lavish gifts in return they were trying to outdo each other in the splendor of the gifts they gave so he avoided the cost of war and filled the royal treasury clever guy he was an ardent supporter of the old religion and he spilt, um, he spent extravagantly on the arts and there were many building projects. Now these statues are now called the Colossi of Memnon thanks to the ancient Greeks who mistakenly thought they represented King Memnon who was a hero of the Trojan Wars, King of Ethiopia who led his armies from Africa into Asia Minor, um, but was ultimately slain by Achilles, according to Greek mythology. As a result, the Greeks and the Romans who visited Egypt both carved inscriptions on the base of the monuments. This is much later, um, 20 to 250 in the Common Era. There are two small figures by the legs of Amenhotep, the leg representing his wife and his mother, and the side panels show the Nile god happy. They're about 18 metres high. Each block, and they are carved from solid blocks, weigh 720 tonnes and had to be transported 420 miles overland from a, from a quarry near modern-day Cairo as they were too heavy to transport on the Nile. So they could transport things by land if they needed to. The, the statues in are a poor state of repair. In the Roman period, so much later, the statues were known to sing or make a sound at dawn. So they were regarded as um, a form of oracle uh, speaking wisdom and were visited by several emperors trying to decode the messages. The last recorded date was 192 in the Common Era. And the sound is actually thought to have been caused by the rapidly rising temperature in the morning evaporating dew from deep inside the porous sandstone rock and the sound was the sound of the water vapour expanding and escaping through a narrow gap. It stopped about the time the Romans reconstructed the top half of the statue which had collapsed. Now in its day the temple, the memorial temple, which is behind, was the largest in Egypt, even larger at the time than the temple of Karnak. But it was destroyed by two earthquakes and as it's in the floodplain of the Nile, it was gradually over the years washed away, leaving just these two colossi and the, the ruins behind it that we see today. Now, as I said, Amenhotep III was an ardent supporter of the old religion, but his son, Amenhotep IV, was the most radical of all the pharaohs. He abandoned Egypt's extreme polytheism and introduced the worship of one god, Aten, and he changed his name to Akhenaten and he directed his workers to chisel out, to destroy the images and names of all the other gods. Luckily for us, they didn't manage to destroy them all. He's been described as enigmatic, mysterious, revolutionary, the greatest idealist in the world, the first individual in history, but he's also been thought of as a heretic, a fanatic, and possibly insane. 
it, it, in some ways, it's almost as if he was dropped into ancient Egypt from um, another planet or from the future. I joke, of course, but um, his statues and his religious beliefs do show a fundamental break with the old art, which by then, remember, had been established for some 1,500 years, essentially unchanged. Now, looking at this statue, the idiosyncratic features suggest it represents his particular face, although other statues of him, of him are more generalised, so it's difficult to interpret um, what's going on here. Now, his wife, who's also um, a well-known name, Nefertiti, I think she's probably so well known because of this bust now in the Museum of Berlin. A, a, a break from um, the previous um, busts and statues we've seen. Long, thin necks, strained tendons, radiating beauty and power. One of the most copied works of art of ancient Egypt. Now, it's thought that it was made by the sculptor Thutmose as it was found in his workshop. The um, left eye, I think, yes, you can see it in this, is unfinished. Or the glass, remember they put inserted glass into the eye to make it more realistic. The glass fell out and was lost, although the... the um, the studio, the workshop in which it was found, was um, searched thoroughly, but the, the piece of glass wasn't found. We don't know why she's missing an eye. There's various theories. One is that this uh, bust was designed to be placed next to a wall where the right eye wouldn't be seen. I'm not sure about that theory. I think I'm more inclined to believe the glass fell out. Um, there are other theories. One is that she had an eye condition and lost her left eye, although other statues show her with a left eye, so I'm not so inclined to that theory. And um, another theory that I'm uh, not so sure about as well is that this, um, this bust was simply a working model, which is why it was found in the workshop, used to show students how to carve an eye to, in order to insert the glass, but it seems to me unlikely that such a perfectly finished piece would have been necessary to demonstrate such a procedure. But um, that's um, the two of them, but there's more to come about this to, to illustrate how revolutionary the changes they made were. This type of domestic scene is unique in ancient Egyptian art. It shows on the left Akhenaten, on the right his wife Nefertiti, with their three young daughters playing. Above the sun god Aten shines his rays down upon the happy family. Akhenaten is holding something in his left hand that his daughter is playing with, a sort of toy, while his wife holds two younger daughters on her lap. It has been claimed that this stella, um, this ceremonial slab, is a fake, as it shows Akhenaten left-handed, which broke with Egyptian tradition, but much of what he did broke with Egyptian tradition anyway. Uh, but also the word mart, which means truth or justice is written incorrectly in four places on the slab and so it has been suggested that it's a forgery. However, this stella or house altar now in Berlin is another representation of the family so the one I just showed you isn't the only one. Here we see um, them playing with their children again and this one is uh, believed to be genuine but by the way uh, the uh, elongated heads of the daughters isn't um, 
an intentionally produced deformity. It's an indication of the power of the sun god Arden. It's purely stylistic. It's, it's not a, an inherited deformity or an intentionally produced one. But here again, we see a family, happy family group blessed by the sun god Arten. Another example, here we see them holding hands, a very unusual pose in the New Kingdom. She's dressed in a translucent dress. He has this exaggerated stomach. The couple completely broke away from the ancient Egyptian religion and, of course, they grew up in a land where there was a hierarchy of priests who'd been um, celebrating the old religion for one and a half thousand years. They were a powerful class. And so to, to, to break with the tradition, to break away from the power of the priests, he moved the capital to a new location in the desert. He built a new city in the desert called Amarna, and um, it was built in 1346 BCE and then abandoned after his death in 1332 BCE. What's that? Some 14 years later. And the site is now largely desert. It's about 300 kilometres south of Cairo and 400 kilometres north of Luxor, or then Thebes. Um, so it's in in the middle of the desert. It was built in about five years and to speed up construction it was built using mud bricks, which is one reason why it's largely disappeared back into the desert. And this style, this art style, has been no, come, come to be called Amarna, the Amarna style. The the, the, the many of the I'm, I'm struggling with trying to describe these different f types of statue of the king. Some are more realistic, like this one. Some emphasise his body peculiarities, if he did in fact have them, like this the elongated face that I showed you at the beginning, the almost um, feminine breasts he has in some of the um, the sculptures, the swelling hips, and Nefertiti is often shown in the most remarkably sensual manner. I'll give you one example that's in the Louvre, this one, for example, or, or like the one we've been looking at. Um, that is a, a new innovation in art. So the, the, all the thousand, the thousand gods of ancient Egypt, the gods and goddesses, were replaced by this single god, Arden. But we know from excavations, uh, modern day excavations at Amarna, that um, I think unsurprisingly probably that many of the officials, many of the workers continued to worship the old gods. We don't know whether this was officially approved, probably not. It was probably just personal preference. One of the most popular gods we found in the um, in Amarna is um, this one, Bez, a grotesque dwarf figure who warded off evil spirits and was the god of motherhood and childbirth and later uh, regarded as the defender of everything good and the enemy of all that is bad. So it's like a talisman people would keep on them, one of the, one of the old gods that um, they didn't want to lose. I've been showing you statues and tombs and temples of the pharaohs, but um, they also, and I've shown you some tomb art, but I'll, I'll show you a few other pieces of tomb art. Um, that, that This one was um, in the tomb of a middle-ranking official, Neberman, who was a scribe and grain accountant. Now, he worked in a temple complex near Thebes, and in 1820, his lavishly decorated tomb was discovered, and this is one of the wall paintings. Um, unbelievably, 
the location of the tomb is now lost. We don't know where it is, but luckily the British Museum acquired a number of the wall paintings um, before um, the, the, uh, the discoverer of the tomb died without leaving a good record of where the tomb was. And these wall paintings are now amongst the greatest treasures of the British Museum and they are very unusual in that some look at the figures down the bottom left they're shown full face and we've seen and I've said that um, the standard way of representing figures and we see this at the top the officials and their wives at the top are in the traditional pose the profile view of the heads but um, this is to show that they could the artists could represent people in however they wanted and the artist has chosen to show the musicians at the bottom full face. Um, so it, it, in other words, the, the way they're shown at the top is a, a, a convention. And remember, the art is not produced to be seen on a regular basis in people's homes. It was produced purely for tombs, it's tomb art, and it's part of a complex series of funeral procedures and practices. And so it follows a strict artistic convention because it's part of a strict uh, funerary procedure, which is designed to enable the deceased person to enter the afterlife. And so following the strict rules was an important part of the procedure. But it could be broken, as we see with these musicians down the bottom. What we see here is actually a feast taking place. There's a naked serving girl, or almost naked serving girl at the top, towards the left, holding out a dish. And below her, the musicians are accompanied by dancing girls and to their to to the right of the dancing girls is a large supply of wine those amphora contain wine the artist has of course captured the sinuous and lively movements of the young dancers i think i've got a close up yes who are naked apart from their jewelry now the we know from wall paintings, many wall paintings, that dance was a fundamental part of the culture, going back even to the pre-dynastic period, 4,000 to 3,200 BCE, so up to 6,000 years ago. Men, women and children are shown dancing, accompanied by a wide range of musical instruments. And dancing was performed at a wide range of different sorts of ceremonies, some religious, uh, some secular. Now, professional dancers uh, might perform naked, almost naked as here. They're sometimes shown wearing loincloths and sometimes shown using uh, wearing transparent robes or skirts, particularly new during the New Kingdom. I would say overall most dancers are shown um, clothed, although often in transparent clothing, um, but the, this isn't unique. Um, a number are um, shown uh, naked, so it was obviously um, one a style of dancing uh, that was performed by professional dancers. Now this is another wall painting from the same tomb, Nebermans tomb, with and this is him, his portrait, he's out hunting. We see the marshes bursting with animal life, including easily identifiable, accurately um, drawn and painted egrets, Egyptian goose, um, pied wagtails, fish, lotus flowers, butterflies, all of which can be identified and you can see there's um, a tabby cat catching a bird. The, the, the cat, incidentally, was discovered to have a gilded eye during the um, examination of these pieces. 
uh, cats, incidentally, were um, f family pets and also could represent the sun god. The um, Neberman's standing in a small boat. His wife is standing behind him and his young daughter below him. These marshes were seen as a place of rebirth and also associated with eroticism. So there are multiple layers of meaning here. He's triumphing, oh, triumphing over nature. He's being reborn into the afterlife um, known as the, the field of reeds, uh, forever happy, forever young. The, the hieroglyphics say something like uh, Neberman here enjoying himself and seeing beauty. And that's just um, a detail. So you can see the, the cat is, well, catching uh, two, if not three birds simultaneously. We've now reached the most famous pharaoh, Tutankhamun. He became a pharaoh when he was nine. He died when he was 19, so he had a very short reign. He undid all the work of his father, Akhenaten, and restored the old religion, moved the royal court away from Amarna, and um, to signify the change, he changed his name from Tutan. Carmen to Tutankhamun and he's one of the few pharaohs to be made to rule as a god during his lifetime. Now the tomb art suggests he was trained in weaponry and we don't know but he may have taken part in battles. Uh, the cause of his death because he died young was disputed but we think he died of a complication around a broken leg compounded by gangrene. His tomb was discovered in 1922 by Howard Carter and the news hit the headlines worldwide. There were something like 5,000 artefacts found in the tomb, which is actually quite a small tomb for his status. Possibly it, because he died unexpectedly, he was buried in a, a tomb built for somebody else because the Egyptians, uh, one of the aspects of the procedures following death is the burial had to take place within 70 days of the death. And by the way, it's worth mentioning the so-called curse of the pharaohs was fueled by newspaper reports at the time and had no basis in fact. 58 people entered the tomb when it was unsealed and of these the Earl of Carnarvon did die five months later but he was very frail following a car accident and he died of pneumonia. Only seven others of the 58, only seven others died over the next 12 years and his daughter, who also entered the tomb, lived another 57 years and died aged 78. This is the famous solid gold funerary mask of Tutankhamun, perhaps the best known of all Egyptian artworks. Exquisite workmanship. There are even two slightly different alloys of gold painting the surface. Maybe you can see the slight difference in the colour. The mask is covered with um, precious stones. It was discovered in the tomb and the beard had become separated from the mask and so it was reattached with a wooden dowel. In 2014, so fairly recently, when the mask was removed for cleaning, the beard fell off. The museum staff panicked, quickly stuck it back on with, of all things, epoxy resin, but they'd stuck it on crookedly. This was noticed by a visitor. Eight museum employees were fined for ignoring scientific methods of restoration. And then a German-Egyptian team had to remove the epoxy 
and reattached the beard using beeswax, which was the material that would have been used in a, by the ancient Egyptians. A, on the back, there. this is a protective spell from the Book of the Dead. It's inscribed in hieroglyphics on the mask's shoulders. It describes the appearance of the face as being that of the god of the afterlife, Osiris. And it was believed that kings preserved in the likeness of Osiris would rule the kingdom of the dead. Confusingly, the older Egyptian belief was that dead kings would be reanimated as the song, sun god Ra, whose body was made of gold. So I think this tomb contains a mixture of both legends um, uh, just in case. Um, as he died young, his death preparations hadn't been completed and several of the objects, possibly including this mask, some experts believe have been reappropriated from the two pharaohs whose short reigns preceded his. And so, in other words, this mask was started for them, but um, appropriated and um, completed quickly for Tutankhamun. We now come to Ramesses II, known as Ramesses the Great, the most celebrated and powerful pharaoh. At the height of the power of ancient Egypt, he, le he led many military campaigns and lived till he was 90 or possibly 91. He built this great temple at Abu Simbel and flanking the entrance, you can see here four seated colossal figures, each about 20 metres tall. Each figure is a depiction of Ramesses II, seated on his throne, wearing his double crown of Egypt. Around his knees, there are small carvings of some of his wives and children. Beneath, you can see smaller figures that depict his conquered enemies, including the Libyans, the Nubians, the Hittites. Inside, Ramesses II, disguised as the god Osiris, and there's a depiction of the king's victory at the Battle of Kadesh. Finally, if you go right to the back, there's an inner sanctum where there are statues of the god Putar on the left, Amun, Ramesses II and Ra on the right, all seated. Now on February the 21st and October the 21st, the sun penetrates right through, shines through to this inner sanctum and illuminates all the figures except for Ptah, who's the god of the underworld and stays in darkness. Now, part of the mortuary temple of Ramesses II, called the uh, Ramesseum, is situated in the burial area, the necropolis at Thebes, and was originally called the House of Millions of Years of Ramesses II. Ramesses II's statue is in pieces, but it's believed to have originally weighed over a thousand tons. It's about a kilometer away from the earlier ruined temple of Amenhotep III that I showed you with its colossi of Memnon. Remember there are um, uh, 700 tons. Clearly the pharaohs were trying to outdo each other in size of their statues. But um, temple of a million years, it reminds me of the poem by Percy Bysshe Shelley Ozymandias, which remember is the Greek name for Ramesses II. Part of it goes, My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, 
boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. On this site, the Ramesseum, the famous archaeologist Flinders Petrie discovered what's been called the Ramesseum Magician's Box. So what do we mean by Magician's Box? It, it contains um, a collection of items relating to Egyptian spells and magic. It's the most complete ever found. So that leads on to the what are the spells for? Well, they centred around the most important aspect of the tombs, which was the procedures and spells necessary for entering the afterlife correctly and living for eternity with the gods. And the way this was done was by following the procedures described in the Book of Coming Forth by Day, which we call the Book of the Dead. And many versions have been found, and this one, which is part of the Book of the Dead of Hanifa, is the best preserved. It's about 8 metres, 23 feet long, and about 25 centimetres or 10 inches high and contains 190 chapters of spells and prayers that enable the dead to pass through the stages necessary to achieve an eternal afterlife. Now Hanifa and his wife Nasha lived around 1310 BCE and he was a royal scribe, overseer of royal cattle, steward of King Seti I, who was father of Ramesses II. So he would have been close to the king, an important person. And in this section, we see his wife and daughter, um, the paler skinned figures with the white clothes, mourning while three priests perform rituals behind them. The two priests with white sashes are performing the ceremony of the opening of the mouth, a critical ritual. The white building on the right is his tomb with a um, steely, steely outside showing, sh shown larger than life so we can read the inscription on it. And below on the table there are the implements shown floating above the table uh, that are necessary for the ritual of the opening of the mouth and to the um, to the left a, um, the, there's a man carrying the foreleg of a calf being offered to the gods it's a traditional offering and in fact uh, the calf is shown on the left missing the leg with its mother showing signs of distress behind the calf This is another page from the Book of the Dead, and this is perhaps the, the central um, aspect of the ceremony, the most important aspect of the ceremony. Um, so, so a key moment at the top, Hanifa is shown on the left, worshipping a row of gods and goddesses who are supervising his judgment. And so below on the left, we see him being led by Anubis, god of funerary rites, who has a jackal's head. He's bringing him to be judged. So how do they judge them? Well, what they do is um, weigh the deceased Honifer's heart, which is in a pot, tiny little pot, against an ostrich feather on the right of the scales. The ostrich feather representing Mart, the goddess of truth and justice. And it was believed that the heart was the seat of emotions and 
the intellect and the character of the person. So the scales represent the judgment of that person's character. If the heart is heavy, then the dead person would be devoured by the creature that we see there that's part crocodile, part lion, part hippopotamus. However, if the heart is light, it passes the test, as we see here, and the um, Hanifa is brought into the presence of Osiris by his son Horos, while in the middle, Thoth, here, this is Thoth, God of Knowledge, is noting down the result of the judgment Hanifa has passed and is being presented by Horos to Osiris here. Note, by the way, that um, the gods have multiple roles. Behind Osiris, here is his wife and sister, Isis, who's goddess of good fortune, protector of the dead, and her sister, Nephthys, goddess of mourning. She was also a goddess of night, temples, childbirth, the dead, protection, magic, health, embalming. And to top all of that, she was goddess of beer. So it's difficult to place these gods in a hierarchy. Isis, for example, the one at the back, Osiris's wife and sister, had magical powers that exceeded those of all the other gods. She protected the kingdom from its enemies, governed the skies and the natural world, and wielded power over fate itself. So they all, the gods and goddesses, had multiple roles that applied in different ways depending upon the uh, situation and the procedures being followed. We now enter, we come to the end of the New Kingdom. We're now entering another period of conflict and chaos called the Third Intermediate Period. It began when Ramesses the 11th died in 1077 BCE. This is the coffin set on the left of uh, Naoni, a royal princess known as the Chantress of Armun because she was responsible for singing and performing rituals in the Temple of Armun, a highly respected position. She died in her 70s, was buried in the Valley of the Queens at the start of the Third Intermediate Period. And on the right here, we have the Book of the Dead and... Uh, relevant to her, we see her being judged by Anubis again. This is her um, being judged by Anubis, her heart here being weighed against um, the feathers, represent, sometimes there's one, sometimes there's two feathers, representing Mart, the goddess of truth and justice. And then watching over it, this procedure, there's the um, uh, god of Cyrus, and on top here, She's entering the tomb, gateway to the afterlife, and meeting Horos, god of protection. So again, a description of the procedures that need to be followed to enter the afterlife. After the fall of the 24th Egyptian dynasty, around 1000 BCE, the Nubian kingdom of Kush which is modern-day Sudan, became a leading power in the region. So for over 50 years, Nubian kings ruled over much of Egypt, although they did follow a lot of the Egyptian um, procedures and um, gods and goddesses. They built pyramids. It was um, some 800 years after the Egyptians stopped building pyramids. So they're harking back 
that they're building the Nubian pyramids are much smaller than the old pyramids. And in fact, there's twice as many Nubian pyramids as Egyptian period pyramids still standing. And it was at this time that animal mummification became a major industry during the, um, the late period, which followed the Third Intermediate Period and the Ptolemaic Period, which I'll explain in a moment. And it's estimated that there's some 70 million of these mummies produced over something like a thousand years from about 800 BCE to 400 CE. Now, animals had always been an important part of Egyptian culture, and you've seen that many of the gods have animal heads. And many types of animals were mummified. Uh, we don't know exactly why, but it was to honour a particular god or goddess. For example, Bastet, who's a cat goddess. And others included cows, falcons, frogs, baboons, vultures and so on. So to honour a particular god or goddess as an offering to the gods. Perhaps even to provide a proper burial for a beloved pet. They kept cats as pets. A symbolic representation of the journey to the afterlife or part of a particular religious ceremony or ritual. Although perhaps the main reason, in my mind, uh, the, the cynical reason, is that selling mummified animals became a significant money raiser, a significant industry, and provided a very good income for the priests. I also had to mention this, the Rosetta Stone. I said, I think in the first talk, I said um, uh, that I would tell you later how we know, how we can read the hieroglyphics. It was through the Rosetta Stone. It was discovered in 1799 by French soldiers near the town of Rosetta in Egypt, which is why it's called the Rosetta Stone, taken back to Paris. And in 1801, it was gifted to um, the British as part of the Treaty of Amiens. And it played a key role in deciphering hieroglyphics because it's written in three languages. It was um, carved to promulgate the decrees issued by Ptolemy I. And at the top, there's Egyptian hieroglyphics. In the centre, there's Egyptian demotic script, the um, freehand script that they use for everyday purposes. And at the bottom, thankfully, there's ancient Greek and ancient Greek was understood. So we could, when this was discovered, we could read ancient Greek, but not the hieroglyphics. And so this was used to decipher the hieroglyphics and demotic script. One of the most important archeological discoveries because without it, we wouldn't understand the culture of ancient Egypt to the extent we do today. So the late period I just mentioned was the last flowering of native Egyptian art after the third intermediate period ended. It included um, rule by Persia, the Nubians, for a short time the Assyrians, but it ended with the conquest of uh, the Persians who were ruling Egypt at the time by Alexander the Great and the establishment of the Ptolemaic period. And this mosaic which was actually found in Pompeii, not uh, Egypt, but I'm showing it because it represents the defeat of the Persian ruler Darius III here by Alexander the Great here. Now, Darius was pharaoh of Egypt from 336 to 332 BCE, and it was 332 that he was defeated by Alexander, and Alexander the Great became essentially the pharaoh of Egypt. Um, when he was, uh, he succeeded his father, Alexander, when he was 20. Um, and by the time he was 30, he had created one of the largest empires in history, stretch, stretching from Greece to northwestern India, undefeated in battle, largely regarded as one of the greatest and most successful military commanders in history. And 
just to give you an idea of the sort of person he was, he only spent a few months in Egypt. He followed the traditions. He was crowned in the temple of Ptah in Memphis. Immediately, he began the restoration of Egyptian temples that had been neglected by the Persians. He consulted with the oracle at Amun-Ra. He was pronounced the son of the god Amun. He founded the city of Alexandria. He reformed the Egyptian taxation system and he reorganised the military. This is in a few months. He then left Egypt, never to return. And control of Egypt passed to one of his generals, Ptolemy, who founded the Ptolemaic dynasty, which lasted from about 300 BCE to 30 BCE. And it ended with the death of Cleopatra. The, the woman, or the queen we call Cleopatra, was actually the seventh Cleopatra, Cleopatra the seventh in 30 BCE, who became the last pharaoh of Egypt. It was a time of prosperity, um, cultural patronage of the arts and the sciences, um, the Egypt was still one of the richest and most powerful kingdoms. And it came to an end, the Ptolemaic period, when Egypt was conquered by the Romans in 30 BCE and Cleopatra committed suicide and Egypt became a Roman province. Now, we don't know what Cleopatra looked like. Um, but this is a Roman marble bust on the left from the time she visited Rome. So it could be accurate. We don't know. She was known for her intelligence, beauty and political acumen. She spoke, we know, several languages. She was well educated in mathematics, philosophy, astronomy. And she's known for her romantic relationship with Julius Caesar and later Mark Antony, two of the most powerful men in Rome. Incidentally, it's possible that her beauty, famed beauty, um, was invented by those in Rome who wanted to denigrate her by ignoring her intelligence, just describing her as beauty and that she used her beauty to seduce Mark Antony. So the defenders of Mark Antony were, were trying to say, well, it's only because he was seduced by her that um, they formed this uh, political alliance and he became her lover. But Cleopatra and Mark Antony were defeated by Octavian, later known as Augustus. She fled Alexandria and committed suicide by allowing an asp to bite her. So we come towards the last slide towards the end of my talk, the Roman period. And I wanted to show you this because um, I find them so surprising in a way when you first see them. We find them on sarcophagi in the Roman period. They reflect the art of Greece and Rome combined with the tomb riot rites of ancient Egypt. Uh, but there's a new realism reflecting the Roman culture which signifies the end of ancient Egyptian culture and art. These images are from what's called the Coptic period, um, roughly equivalent to the Byzantine period. Or, and um, it began with the introduction of Christianity in Egypt in the first century um, common era during the Roman period. And, and in fact, the, the Coptic religion and the Coptic language survived to the present day. And the Coptic language is still used by Coptic Christians. And it's a direct descendant of the ancient Egyptian languages. So vestiges of ancient Egypt still survive. Well, that brings us to the end of over 3000 years of Egyptian art. And during this um, vast period, the religion and artistic expression followed, mostly followed established conventions. And I've, I've pointed out the, the few exceptions. It must be the longest uninterrupted break of um, a single dominant artistic expression. 
um, that we've seen in Western art. I end with the bust of Nefertiti, which represents the one short break in the 3,000 years of traditional Egyptian art. She and her husband, Akhenaten, remain a mystery inside an enigma, the enigma of ancient Egypt. Thank you.